Welcome back into the Tell Me Teaching Series here, and we're in our class BI 200, the Book of Revelation. BI 200, the Book of Revelation, and we're looking at the message specifically here, the messages of the glorified Christ to the seven churches that are spelled out for us in great detail in, in, in Revelation chapter 1, verses, starting in verse 9, in chapter 2, and in chapter 3. And right now, we've been focusing in on the message to the church at Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. And we want to go back and read this and put it in its, in its proper context, okay? Because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to be a much more practical in our approach to the scriptures here in understanding how do churches wind up where they wind up, okay? This does not happen overnight. This comes over, the, all of these developments happen over a long period of time where basically at some point, at some point, the, the pastor, the preacher stop leading and they start following the congregation. They will acquiesce, they will resign themselves, they're tired, they fought the good fight, or they believe they fought the good fight and they're tired and nothing is happening, okay? So they begin to just resign themselves just to go to the pulpit and just simply preach. Okay? And they forget that the Lord of the church is Jesus the Christ. It is he who does the speaking. And this is the biggest thing that we find in many, many churches that people just simply look at the Word of God as black ink on white paper and forget that this is God Himself, the Spirit of God that is speaking to us. And we can, t and people, it's amazing to see how people just completely tune out who God really is, and their whole focus is on that preacher, okay? They're looking on that preacher, they're looking at that pastor. He's too tall, he's too short, he's too skinny, he's too fat, he's too this, he's too that. And and then and then if they're, they're looking for to find out what he says. If they like what he says, bravo. If he doesn't like what he says, forget him. And, so, and, and we have this disdain, this profound disdain and blasphemous attitude. And when many people sit in the church week in and week out, week after week, month after month, year after year, and, and, they've, and the only thing they've done is they've given mental assent to what the Word of God says. They've intellectualized it completely, and they've tuned out that this is actually God who is speaking to us. So this is, I want to pick this up now in this particular session, and let's go back to, let's go back to Revelation chapter 2. Let's open up our Bibles, and we're looking at the message to the church in Ephesus, and this is what we're looking at. Now, this is our fourth installment, and let's begin to look at this, and I want to just draw your attention, because, you know, when you're teaching expository, you're teaching verse by verse, phrase by phrase, and sometimes word by word, and what you're doing is you're digging down deep to see what the implications are and the declarations are of the Word of God, and what does that mean in the overall in, in the overall scheme of the church, in the overall picture of the church, in the, as well as how how does all this tie together in the scriptures from Genesis to Malachi, Malachi to Genesis, Matthew to Revelation, Revelation back to Matthew, okay? And that's what we're looking at. So let's go back and let's look at the message here in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And remember, I'm teaching at a New American Standard Version, so all, so I want you to know, all pastors, look, we have 11 countries that are tuning in, all these pastors, they have all kinds of different versions of the Bible, so just follow along in your version, and then I want to thank you in advance for all the questions that you send in by text. So let's read, starting in verse 1, Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put the test, you put the test to those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds that you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Therefore, look what he says. Yet this you do have that you ha that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now I want you to go back with me to verse one. Okay, let's look at verse one, because this is where we're still we we haven't gotten out of verse one yet. Okay? And, and I want you to look at this thing with me because he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Look at this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, I want you to write. He says, he says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now, 
Who is the correspondent? Who is the writer? Who is speaking here? Is this just black ink on white paper? Is, just, is this the preacher's interpretation? Who is actually speaking? Who is voicing, okay, his great concern from the throne of God? God. And we must understand, this is God who is speaking to us. And as I said at the outset, we have so many people sitting in the church with complete disdain. They, got, they have deaf ears. They don't hear what God is saying. And they've got their own ideas and they've got their own interpretation. Well, I think, in my opinion, and I feel. And, and the preacher knows that and he never addresses that issue. And he allows it to go on and on to the point that now it becomes, okay, a set pattern. To, to completely ignore the voice of God in the Word of God, to ignore the Spirit of God in the Word of God. You cannot separate the Word from God, and you cannot separate the Spirit from the Word of God. That's, it. That's an act of impossibility. So we come to this point here, and he says here, at, toward the end of verse 1, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Though we know that the writer, okay, is not named by name, but the description makes it obvious who he is. He is the one depicted as the glorious Lord of the church. And we see this. We read this at the, at, the, at the beginning of the series in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. It's the exalted Christ. That's who he's speaking to, the exalted Christ. Okay? The phrase where he says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands are taken from the description of Christ in John's vision. And we see it. John had this vision, right? Well, just go back into chapter 1, Revelation, and look at verse 13. Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 says, And in the middle of the lampstand, I saw the one like a son of a man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, reaching, reaching to feet, to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. Who is that a description of? This is Jesus, the exalted Christ. Well, look at verse 16. Drop down three verses and go down to verse 16. And he says, His right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his strength. This is who he's speaking to. In fact, Christ, Christ identifies himself to each of the first five churches by using the phrase from that vision. I mean, we see this, for example. Let me, let me see. I'm, I'm going to beat this dead horse, okay? Because you see so many people, they just sit there blank eyed. Okay? I mean, there's nothing happening here. It's not registering, okay? And let me tell you, from, a, from, from the perspective of the pulpit, the perspective of a preacher, that's very frustrating. You come in there with, with, with a nonchalant attitude. You're not moved whatsoever with what the Word of God says. And this speaks volumes, volumes to your relationship to God through His Word. You have, in fact, for most people, if truth be told, they have a greater relationship with the idea of the church, not, not the owner of the church, not the creator of the church. And, and I want you to see who is speaking here. I want to drive that home to you. Okay? Who is speaking to us every Sunday when that preacher stands up? Who is doing the talking? We understand that we have a human mouthpiece, but whose words are being told, uh, are being spoken here? Now, I want you to see this because Christ identifies himself to each of the first five churches, right? By using the phrases from that particular vision that we just read in Romans, I mean, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, okay? And we see this uh, in, in Revelation chapter 2 with, with Revelation chapter 1. Let me, let me show you this because that really reinforces a truth. What truth? It reinforces the truth, the truth that he is the author of the letters. They are his direct word through the Apostle John to the local congregation, to the churches like them in years beyond. He is the same one who is speaking to us today. If you actually believe that he's the eternal God, he is the one who is speaking to us today. Now, look, look at this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. Who's that? Jesus. Well, go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to go back and forth, back and forth. Look what he says. And the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death of Hades. Who is that? Christ. Well, now go, to, go, to, go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, and he says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. Who is that? Christ, the exalted Christ. 
Well, go back to Rome, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. I, I, I want to keep going to Romans. It's Revelation. Revelation 1, 16, and he says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his strength. Who is that? That's Christ. We'll go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Again, to the angel of the church in Theatira. In Theatira. Write this, the Son of God who has the eyes like a flame and a fire and his feet are like burn, burnished bronze says this. Who's this? Christ, the exalted Christ. That's who's speaking to, that, that's who we're speaking then and it's the same Christ that is speaking to us today. Well, go back to Revelation chapter 1 and look at verse 14 and 15. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. He says, his head and his hair were like white, were, were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when he, when, he has, when he has been made to glow in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. Who were we talking about? Christ, the exalted Christ. Well, now go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, and he says this, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write this, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, that you are alive but you are dead. Who are we talking about? Who is doing it? This is Christ, the exalted Christ. Well, now go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, he says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his strength. Look, I want you to note, as noted previously, okay? What are the seven stars? Okay, well, the seven stars represent leaders from the seven churches. That's 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 the symbolism here. Okay, that Christ holds them in His right hand. He holds these seven these seven ministers, these seven preachers. Okay, in His right hand, and it indicates what? It indicates that they are His ministers. You're not the church's minister. Stop there. Time out. You are not the church's minister, with all due respect. You are not you are not the elder's minister. You are not the deacon's minister. You are not the influential families, okay, in the church's minister. You are a minister of Christ who holds you in your right hand. You better get this right. And okay, and the, and it indicates that they are his ministers sitting in his hands, okay, under his power, and he medi and he meditates his sovereign rule, okay? He mediates, rather. He mediates his sovereign rule in the church through its human leaders. The direction, the divine direction of leadership is coming from God the Christ through the minister to the congregation. But what we have is we have the complete opposite today where the congregation, okay, has put the cart before the horse and now they're running the show. And nobody's going anywhere. Christ further describes himself as the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Isn't that true? The seven churches. And what is he doing? He's just taking a stroll because he's bored? No. He's scrutinizing. Okay? He's examining. He's assessing. And he's evaluating the churches. It it, as it, you know, why, why, why is he doing that? Because he is the sovereign ruler of the church. He has the authority to address the church. And he does so through his servant. Now, let me show you this. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, he says, As for, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, he said, and the seven golden lampstands, and the seven stars are the angels... Of the seven churches. Now the word. Look what he says. There, are the angels of the seven churches? <clears throat> and he says. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now the symbolism of the seven angels is the seven ministers, the heads of the church. Now, so we we have to establish who is talking, who's writing. This isn't the opinion of Joe Blow from Kokomo. Okay. This is God talking to us. And every time you come into that church and you sit down, and if that preacher has a significant, okay, profound prayer life, okay, you're going to know that that's God speaking through him. It's not his idea. It's not his opinion. It's not about his feelings. It's not about his politics. So you need to grasp that idea. So every time you walk in, okay, you see that preacher up there on that platform behind that pulpit, this is God who's speaking to us. Now, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to the church. 
He's speaking to the church. Go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. He's not speaking to Joe Blow from Kokomo. He's not spoken, he's not speaking to, to you know to, to anybody out there. He's not speaking, he's speaking to the church. In Revelation 2, 1, he says to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Of the church of Ephesus. He didn't say of the community center of Ephesus. He didn't say the cultural center of Ephesus. He didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't say you know, the, the city of Ephesus. He's speaking to the church of Ephesus. He says, write to the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lamps says this. Now you have to listen to what he is saying. Who is he directing it to the church? Look, perhaps, could be. Perhaps no church in history has had a rich heritage as the congregation in Ephesus. I mean, they had the best teaching, the best lineup of preachers, okay? In the early history of this church, they had the best of the best. The gospel was introduced to that city by the, by the apostle Paul himself, okay? And, and, you know, because it was his, the close friends and the partners in the ministry, okay, who first got there, okay? Just before Paul got there, and remember who they were? It was Priscilla and Aquila. Remember that? Priscilla and Aquila got there first, okay? They were Paul's friends, and they preached. Let me show you this. Acts chapter 18, verse 19 and 18 and 19. Acts chapter 18, verse 19 and 18. Let's turn our Bible here, and um, I'm in verse 19. No, no. I'm in chapter 19. Verse chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And look what he says. In, in 18, 18, and 19, he says, verse 18, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In, in, in Sancrea, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Remember, he was a Benjamite. Okay? And then they came to Ephesus, and he left them. He left Priscilla and Aquila. Right? And now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, okay? And now it's Priscilla Quill who goes in there and they present the gospel. It wasn't the gospel of Paul. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, after that, they were soon joined by the, by the great eloquent preacher and the powerful debater who was Apollos. Remember Apollos? He was a young, brilliant preacher, okay? But he wasn't all that mature and he didn't have all the information yet, but... He, he launched himself. Stay with me in the book of Acts chapter 18, verse 24, 25, and 26. Acts chapter 18, verse 24, 25, and 26. Now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian, by birth an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. What scriptures? The Old Testament. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus being acquainted but he was but being acquainted only with the baptism of John that's the only thing he knew and he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately so Priscilla and Aquila play a big big role in Ephesus so does Apollos Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos, they were, you know, you know what the three were doing there? Priscilla, Aquila, and, Apollos, and, Apollos, and Aquila, they, they, were, they were laying the groundwork, the foundation for Paul's ministry in Ephesus. This was not an ignorant church. This was an orthodox church. This church had all the right teaching. I know a lot of pastors who've got all the right teaching in that church, but their church is dead as a doorknob, okay? Because they've become a highly intellectual They've joined, they've joined the Chosen Frozen Club. They just sit there and intellectualize absolutely everything. Every pastor, every preacher you listen to me right now, that's the danger you run. Look, the Apostle Paul, he stopped briefly in Ephesus near the end of his second missionary journey. Remember that? But his real ministry in that key city took place on his third missionary journey. But first, let's look at, stay with me in Acts chapter 18, verses 19, 20, 21. Now, this is important because you have to ask yourself, you know, who were the previous preachers that came to this church before I came? Hmm? Who were the other leaders that were in this church before I came? What is the, what, what, where, where are their fingerprints? Where, where, where is their mark? What did they leave behind as a, as a legacy in this church that still impacts members today? Well, in Acts chapter 18, look at verse 19, 20, and 21. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent. He left. 
But taking leave of them, saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail for Ephesus. Okay? Now, arriving in Ephesus, okay, he first, one, one of the things that happened, he encountered a group. He encountered a group of Old Testament saints who were followers of John the Baptist, who were pointing to the Lamb of God who takes away sins of the world. Remember that in John chapter 1, verse 29? Now, so this is what he encounters right here. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 19. Okay? I want you to see, okay, the legacy of who was in his, who is it, who was in Ephesus. The same way you need to find out who were the previous founders in the and 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 the leadership, okay, of that church who are no longer there. Where are their mark? Where are their fingerprints? What the, what impact did they have, okay, that led this group to still be there today, okay? But they're caught, but they're growing cold and indifferent. Look at this, verses one through seven. Verses 1 through 7. You cannot live on the laurels of the past. You cannot live on the accomplishments of the past. That's foolishness. That is, that is self-aggrandizement, but it is self-deception. He said this in verse 1 through 7, Acts chapter 19. He said, It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Okay. And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. These are Old Testament saints because that's all they knew. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. That's wonderful. Telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus. Now. They didn't see they repented from the sin, but they hadn't turned to Jesus. And and truth be told, that's where a whole lot of people are sitting in the pews today. Sitting in the I mean they they they've become good people unto themselves, okay? But they haven't fallen in love with Jesus. See, if you repent, that's called reformation. Okay? You reform your behavior and so forth and so forth and so forth and so forth, okay? But you never turn to Christ. And you never experience transformation. That is absolutely dangerous. Okay? And he says in verse 5, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And they were all and they were they were in all about twelve men. It was only twelve men in the entire city who had come to Christ. Now, after preaching the gospel to them, okay. He baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Well, look at Acts chapter 19, verse 5. Acts chapter 19, verse 5. He said, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, 40 years ago, and, um, and, and I remember the discussions that we had, um, uh, but we didn't, we never really spoke about preaching the gospel in the church. The entire focus was about preaching the gospel outside of the church to to the happy pagans to the heathens to the unbelievers okay and and that's that was that was a whole focus of preaching the gospel outside okay you know today you have to preach the gospel every sunday in one way or another you're going to have to bring the gospel because you have so much so many who are absolutely 100 percent unadulterated religious but they've never really had an encounter with jesus christ and they're good church members they've been around a long time They'll serve. They'll even serve as elders and deacons, and they'll serve in positions of service. Okay, they'll even they'll even willing to give you a tithe or an offering. Okay, and, and they'll even show up to a prayer meeting. But they never ever had an encounter with Jesus Christ. This is how you can just drift into nothingness, into pure religiosity. And now I make it a point to preach the gospel. Okay. I will teach the full counsel word, but I'm going to find a way to bring the gospel to, uh, toward the end of this message, okay? Because you need an encounter with a living, true, living God. Look, that, that is, that, at that point, when he baptized him in the name of the Lord Jesus, okay? That is really what began Paul's work in the building of the church at Ephesus. That's really the genesis. That's the beginning of it. And anyway, a work that will last, and he, he was there for three years. That's absolutely amazing. He was there for three years. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, the next chapter. In Acts chapter 20, look at verse 31. Verse 31. Therefore, it says, 
Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that the day and night for the period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. He was teaching, 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 preaching, preaching, preaching. He was discipling, discipling. I mean, he was he he was pounding the gospel. He was pounding the word into their hearts. Later on. On his way to Jerusalem, near the end of his third missionary journey, okay, he taught the elders of the Ephesian church the essential principles of church leadership. That's what he had to do. He had to teach them the essential principles of church leadership. And the gist of which is he later expanded in what we know as the pastoral epistles, right? Now, and we see that. We know that to be true because in Acts chapter 17, that's what we see. In fact, let's go there. Look. You know, one of the biggest problems that we have is that we're always in a hurry, okay? And 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 I'm looking, I'm looking to establish foundation, foundation, foundation. So we go to Acts chapter seventeen. I want you to see this with me. <clears throat> you know, Acts, I'm sorry, Acts chapter twenty. And in Acts chapter twenty, uh, I want you to look at this. Go down with me to verse seventeen. It's a long passage, but listen to his content. Okay, follow along with me. So he says, starting in verse 17, and we're going to go down to verse 38 at the end. From Miletus, he sent to the he, he sent to Ephesus and called him to the elders of the church. So that's why that's why he's there. And when they can't come to him, he said to them, "You yourselves know that from the first day which I set foot in Asia, and how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews." How I, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of, of repentance toward God and the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testified to me in every city, saying that the bonds and afflictions await me. He knew he was, go he knew he was on the march. He was on the march, okay, a uh, uh, baton, right? Okay, remember that in World War Two, and he was on he was on the death march. He was headed. He knew he was going to die in, in in Rome. But I do not consider my life of any account as a dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves, for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. He always, Paul always understood that the church was purchased by God. It's not the church membership or the richest member in the city of the church. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that, night and day, remembering that night and day, and for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embrace Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again and they were accompanying him to the ship. So it's at this point that we begin to see this, okay? And then we see we see the birth of the of uh, of the epistles, right? And now he he makes a turn here. He makes a shift, okay? And and Paul's pre uh, protege, remember that Timothy, remember Timothy, served as the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Remember I told you at the beginning, they, the greatest teaching and the greatest preachers, okay, that we knew of the New Testament, okay, they were all pastoring in the church of Ephesus. Let me show you this. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. He says, As I urge you upon my departure for Macedonia, okay, that's the part in, in the northern part of Greece, that's where the Thessalonian church, Thessalonica, the Philippian church is located, that, that's where they're, they're up in that region, okay? And he says, he says, I urge you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. 
Paul understood. He understood all the issues, okay? He already, in his day, he already understood that the wolves had come in and bad teaching and bad preachers were, were among them, moving into the inside, in and out of the house churches, okay? Now, remember there's a person that is mentioned here, okay? And his name is, and it's a funny name, is Anisiphorus, okay? And Anisiphorus, okay, it's a funny, it's a funny name, okay, is O-N-E-S-I-P-H-O-R-U-S, okay? Anisiphorus, and there was a guy, Tychus, okay? Now, a lot of times in English we say Tychicus, okay? But it's, it's Tychus, okay? Tychos, Tychos, okay? In Second Timothy chapter 4, now, two more of Paul's fellow laborers also minister at Ephesus, Anisiphorus, okay, Anisiphorus and Tychus, okay? Now, we can see it. Let me show you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Second, and this, now, why am I doing this? Because I want you to understand why the condemnation of God, the wrath of God hits a church. You have had men after men after men who, have, who come and teach you the word of God and you're still cold and indifferent and you're, love, you're, you're more in love with yourself than you are with God. This should be your wake-up call. Preacher, this should be your wake-up call. Congregation, this should be your wake-up call. You have no excuse. Let me show you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. He was another one who was ministering there. Well, turn your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Just drop down two verses and he says, The Lord grant to him talking about Onesiphorus, to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. He was a spiritual leader there. Well, now turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he says, and, but Tychus, okay, I have sent to Ephesus. Now, this is the guy that most people pronounce Tychicus, okay? But I want you to see this. Um, finally, according to the testimony of the early church, even the apostle John, spent the last decades of his life at Ephesus, from which he likely wrote his three epistles in which he calls himself the elder, okay? And this is what we're going to get, first, second, third, uh, um, the first, second, and third epistle, okay? We're going to see that uh, 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 of John, right? That, and he was no doubt leading the Ephesian church when he, arrest, when he was arrested and exiled to Patmos, okay? That, so we get first, second, and third John, those epistles. That's where it was written, in Ephesus, okay? But he, but he called himself as the elder, right? Look, Turn your Bible. Second John chapter one verse one. Second John chapter one verse one. Right. He says, "The elder to the chosen lady and her children." He's talking about himself, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also, but also all who know the truth. Well, turn, turn your Bibles to the third epistle of John, chapter one verse one. Right. It's only one chapter, but but, but look at it. So in third John one one, he says, "The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth." The, this is John the apostle himself. And what we have is all of these uh, dramatic and remarkable events, okay, accompany the birth of the Ephesian church. Paul's ministry profoundly affected not only the city of Ephesus, but the, also the entire province of Asia. That was the impact of this church. Let me show you. Go back to me in Acts chapter 19, verse 10. Acts chapter 19, verse 10. He says, this took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia, that's in a, that's in a profound statement. I mean, look at the amplitude of this statement. He said, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. They preached the gospel. This was a local missionary church. You know a church is in trouble when it makes the decision to sit. And all it does is complain about the circumstances of the culture, the circumstances of the city they live in. It's woe as us, what well, we can't do anything. That's a lie. It's a lie that you have embraced and converted into a and you, and you, and you converted into an urban truth for yourselves to justify why you sit there. Why you sit, you're dying. You become enclosed, self-centered. That's what happens to the church. And as previously mentioned and noted, it was undoubtedly during this time that the rest of the seven churches were founded, okay? Because here's, the first church is the, the Ephesian church, okay? And remember, up that coastline, okay, was 230 cities. Never mind the inland part, okay? And God, how can I say it? 
God supernaturally affirmed. He affirmed Paul as his spokesman through a series of, of spectacular miracles. Uh, um, spectacular miracles. I mean, you could not doubt that this was God. Now, stay with me there in Acts chapter 19. We read verse 10. Now, look. I want you to look at verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that the handkerchiefs or the aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left there and the evil spirits went out. God is displaying in his glorious power, okay? And people are coming to Christ. Now, attempting to emulate Paul, okay? And his success, okay? A group of Jewish would-be exorcists, okay? Were beaten and humiliated by a demon-possessed individual. Remember that? Let me see. Stay with me there in Acts chapter 19. Now drop down to verse 13, 14, 15, and 16. Look at this. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, the seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this, okay? And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? These were wannabes. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. He beat the living daylights out of them. And what happened at this point in the city and in the church, there, it was a debacle. Okay, Their debacle spread fear, consternation throughout the entire city, causing the name of the Lord Jesus to be even magnified even more. Look, look at now drop down to verse 17, okay? Acts chapter 19, verse 17. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus, and the fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. I mean, this, this was shock waves. This is shock waves. They were shocked into realizing the futility in trusting in pagan practices. I am amazed how many how many church members are involved in pagan practices mm -hmm. just in case this thing with Jesus doesn't work out. Stay with me. Now I drop down to verse 18 and 19, Acts chapter 19, 18 and 19. Look at this. It says, Many of or many also of those who had who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price of them and, and found it at fifty thousands of pieces of silver. That's an astronomical amount. Even at even at today's standard. I mean that you know what that staggering sum? The equivalent of fifty thousand thousand days of workers wages there's only 365 days in a year this is the equivalent of 50,000 days of wages of workers it revealed the magnitude it was you know what it was doing it's revealing the magnitude of Ephesus involvement in the magic arts they, they were deeply rooted into paganism okay and, and polytheism and spiritism okay and witchcraft and all that you know where I live in South America, in the, in the city of Cusco, down here, and this entire region out here, in the province, okay, it is jam-packed with that nonsense. And I want you to understand the striking um, conversions, the striking conversions of large numbers of Ephesians posed a severe, severe economic threat to the city's pagan craftsmen. Because Roma, Roma, Roma talked about that. They had the, the, civil, uh, the guild of the silversmiths, okay? It was the, basically the union. Hmm? And, and these people are abandoning their practices, which meant that they're not buying their little idols and Artemis and, and, and Diana, and they, they, they just stopped doing that. And all of a sudden, now they're going to go broke, and now they get mad, okay? You have to remember that Ephesus was the center, was the center of, the worship, of, of the worship of the goddess Artemis, known to the Romans as Diana, okay? Whose ornate temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world at that time. Now, at the instigation... Of a sil uh, there was a silversmith by the name of, of Demetrius. He was a craftsman, okay, who saw their lucrative business in danger. He reacted violently. And the ensuing riot uh, threw Eph Ephesus into a chaos. So there was a riot. I mean, in Ephesus chapter 19, uh, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 19, verses 23 down to 41, read that very carefully in detail. 
Acts chapter 19, verse 23, 41, and a riot broke out. I mean, a riot broke out. Have you never seen a riot in a whole city break out? I mean, it's like the craziness we see here in Cusco. Okay? I mean, it breaks out. Windows are being busted out. Fires are going on. It, you, it, you, you just stay there. It's pure. It's pure. Un, it's pure under the uh, uh, chaos. Okay? Now, by the time that this letter, okay, four decades had passed since the Ephesian church uh, had this tumultuous birth, because that's how it was birth. Okay. The Apostle Paul was gone, and there were many of his first generation of believers converted under his ministry. Okay? And, 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 and they died out. Okay? And you can pretty much tell, pretty much at the end of somewhere at the 30-year mark, 30, 35, 40-year mark, okay? You can see that you can see the church is dying. Okay? Because these were the first, that, that it was the first generation that was set on fire. The second generation and the third generation have no clue. And now we have a new situation in the church of Ephesus. Those people who used to be on fire for Christ, most of them have died out. They're old. They're tired. Okay, They're waiting to die. Okay? And now this new generation comes up, okay, and it has no affiliation, no affection, no true love for the church that was founded. They never had to sacrifice. They're completely disassociated with the idea of sacrifice. They came into something that was already there. And now we have a new situation. Call for another inspired letter to the Ephesians. This one came from the Lord himself, penned by the Apostle John. Wake up. And they're at this stage, okay, of becoming extinct. And this is the stage many, many churches are on. Go back with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now you begin to see now where this letter comes from. He says, verse 1, if, uh, Revelation 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and the one who walks among the seven golden absents, say this, verse 2. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. This is what this they were living, this is their yesteryear. This is this is who they were in the past. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have grown and have not grown weary. Okay? <clears throat> so Jesus is exalting what these people had done. And that's the problem. Is what they had done. Christianity is always the present not what you did in the past. And that's what's inspired. That's what brings this letter. Okay. Go back to verse 1. Now let's talk about that city. Remember that? I'm going to go back and look at that city. Okay, It's really crucial. Because when you live in a place that consumes itself, okay, it has powerful magnets. It just draws out people to the culture, draws out people to the streets. It draws out people to everything that's outside of the church. Look what he says in Revelation 2.1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, say this, although not its capital, okay, now Pergamum was the province of official cap capital, okay, and Ephesus was the most important city in Asia Minor. Since the Roman governor resided there, he, it could be argued that Ephesus was the de facto capital because that's where the, that's where the Roman governor lived, okay. Now, its population during the during the New Testament times had been estimated somewhere between two hundred and fifty thousand and five hundred thousand people. Okay, I mean this is this this was a major city, but it you know, it's like where I live in Cusco, right? It's a, it's a five hundred plus thousand people. This is the place where people come from all over the world, but they're not coming. They don't they don't come just to see the ruins. Okay, they're coming to see all the paganism that these ruins that these ruins represent. And they and they had the city's theater. Okay, it was it's visible today if you go there. Okay, into which this frenzy rioters dragged Paul's companions, Gaius and 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 and, and, our sticker, and, and, and Aristarchus. Okay, that's where they dragged them to beat them. Okay, and and and, and this particular theater held about twenty five thousand. Can you imagine that? In those days, it would hold about twenty five thousand people. This is where they dragged Paul's friends to beat them. Let me show you this. In Acts chapter 19, verse 29. 
The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed into one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonians. Okay? And that's where they beat them. Okay? Now, you have to remember that Ephesus was a free city. It was self-governing within the limits, of course. And, 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 and now we, the reason we say it's a free city, because no Roman troops were garrisoned there. there. There was no garrison there. There was no fort there for the Roman troops, okay? And the city hosted athletic events that actually rivaled the Olympic Games. I mean, this was a humongous, humongous city that was thriving at all kinds of levels, okay? Ephesus was the primary harbor in the province of Asia. By law, incoming Roman governors had to enter Asia through Ephesus. That was by Roman law. The city was located on, the, on, on what's called the, the Castor River, okay? About three miles upriver from where it flowed into the sea. Now, those disembarking at the harbor traveled along in this magnificent, wide, column-lined road, okay, what was known as the Arcadian Way, that led into the center of the city. And so for three miles, basically, okay, it, it, this road had columns, the Arcadian Way. Okay? It was absolutely impressive, okay? It was impressive. Now, in John's day, what happened, remember I told this before? Silt. Silt, S-I-L-T, deposited into the Castor River, was slowly filling up the harbor and forcing the city to fight to keep the channel open, okay? And that battle will ultimately would be lost, okay? And today, the ruins of Ephesus are located some six miles inland from the sea, which should tell you how, how much this silt just kept filling and filling and filling, and it moved, the, it, it, it became a new landmark is what happened to it, okay? And Ephesus was also strate strategically located, okay, at the junction of four of the most important Roman roads in Asia. And so here you have Ephesus, okay, and you have four very key roads, okay, that were crucial in the Roman Empire, okay. And, 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 and that, along with its harbor, prompted the geographer Strabo, if you ever read it, who's uh, a... Um, a uh, a contemporary of Christ, okay, because he lived at that time, okay, to describe Ephesus as the market of Asia. I mean, that was the place to go to. But Ephesus most famous, was most famous as the center of the worship of the goddess Artemis or Diana, a point of great civic pride. I mean, they took great pride. They took absolute great pride to this. It was absolutely amazing. Okay? Stay with me in Acts chapter 19. Look at verse 27. And I want you to see this in Acts chapter 19, verse 27. He said, not only is there danger that this trade of ours falls into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be, may be regarded as worthless and that, she, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be the throne from her magnificence. I mean, they, this was the greatest scare tactic for paganism. Okay? And then drop down to verse, uh, let's see, go down to verse 35. After quieting the crowd... The town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of Ephesians is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and the image of which fell down from heaven? I mean, this is how they were going to defend, they were going to defend their place, okay? And you have to remember that the temple of Artemis and, the, and Ephesus was what was the prominent landmark on those four roads coming into Ephesus, okay? Because its inner shrine was supposedly invaluable, okay? The temple served as one of the most important banks in the Mediterranean world as well. It, the temple was also a bank, okay? I mean, let me tell you how corrupt this was, okay? The temple and its environs also provided, that, that temple also provided a, a, um, a, a sanctuary for criminals. You remember in the Old Testament when we talked about the cities of refuge? And, and people would go to it, and you couldn't touch them, okay? Well, that's basically what the Temple of Diana became. For all of the best-known criminals, I mean, that's where they would go. So it became a center of refuge, of protection for these guys, okay? Further, they had the cell items used in the worship of Artemis provided an important source of income for the city. And they, became, and they set up a commercial center. This is where you bought the little statutes and things, you know, of idolatry and all that, of Artemis and the grotesque Diana and all that, Okay. Look what he says in verse 24, Acts chapter 19, verse 24. For a, name, for a man named Demetrius at the silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. I mean, people, so you have to understand, Paul crossed the ruckus there, okay? And every spring, 
there was this month-long festival, okay, was held in honor of the goddess, complete with athletic, dramatic, and musical events, okay? And Paul, and Paul may have anticipated this annual event as a unique evangelistic opportunity and had been waiting for when he wrote the Corinthians that he intended to remain in Ephesus. Now, go, just briefly go over there with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 8, he said, But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost. The great, this is the, the, the month where all this craziness was happening. That's exactly what we have in Cusco. The month of June, you have every conceivable crazy festivals that go on here, okay? And, it's, and, and, and almost all of it is dedicated to paganism, okay? And now they've added on top of that, okay, the Pride Month of LBGTQ, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So this is the city. Okay? It had decayed and had to be de 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 demoralized, okay? And this is now the setting for this letter. Very much like e almost every city around the world. Yet, we are without excuse.